<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. I know it's our first meeting back after a long summer. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Um, what about September? September's still summer. The, it's like the equinox just hit. Um, last week of September, fourth Wednesday of the month. Here we are, together again. Um, thanks to Leonardo's providing the food tonight. If uh, you brought any containers, feel free to take home some leftovers. Um, and I hope everyone had a chance to sign in and get a name tag. Um, we will do a brief inter introduction for everybody. Also wanted to just do a quick thank you. I see um, Carol Ode and Bob Hooper here. Appreciate you guys being here tonight. Um, those are our state representatives. Uh, <laughs> and Abby Duke, also in the crowd, <laughs> um, which is a very comfortable community crowd. Uh, and then another little shout out to Steve Brown, did I get that right, for bringing some, some delicious dessert. Um, that was just a surprise, so please enjoy that. <laughs> State representatives, dessert, yeah. <laughs> um, there are some agendas on the table to give you an idea of uh, you know, what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and we are going to start off um, just with a little introduction from everybody. And I just wanted to get my agenda to list out our ground rules together. Um, this is a community space. We want everyone to feel, you know, welcome and um, able to share their opinions, but also to listen to others speak, um, not interrupt them, respect the agenda and the process of kind of moving through this so uh, that we can you know, keep time here. Um, and to share your opinion politely, we are here to share and listen, uh, not to argue, and just generally treat people respectfully. So I hope everyone had a chance to, you know, chat with their neighbors as they're eating. And I'm just gonna start by introducing myself. Uh, my name's Sarah, or Sarah. Uh, I use she, they pronouns. I live in Ward 7, and I am one of the steering committee members. Um, and now I'm going to invite everybody to introduce themselves with their name and their ward and their pronouns, if you wish. So if you don't mind, I'll start right here. And there's a microphone in the middle, and we'll pass that off. Hello, my name is Nick. He, him. I live in Ward 7. Hello, my name is Mr. Richard Cagle, and I live in Ward 4. I'm uh, Michael and I live in Ward 7. Kathleen Miles, Ward 4. Mary Jane McMahon, Ward 7. Sabrina, Ward 4. Kayla Dusani, Ward 7. Lynn Eisenbray, Ward 4. Stephen Brown, Ward 7. Steve Norman, Ward 4. Monica Ivancic, also your school board rep for school, uh, Ward 7. Carly Bennett, she, her, Ward 7. Carly Bennett, Ward 7. Abby Duke, Ward 7, and I'm the state rep for the southern part of Wards 4 and 7. Karen Chickering, Ward 7. Susan Ogden, Ward 4, she, her. Brian Kling, Ward 4. I'm Hank Prinsky from Ward 4 and a member of our steering committee. Committee. I'm Bob Hooper. I'm your state rep from Ward 4. Martha Malpas, Ward 7, she, her pronouns. Sammy McCray, Ward 7, she, her pronouns. Vicki Garrison, Ward 7, she, her pronouns. I'm um, a member of the steering committee, and I am your timekeeper this evening. <laughs> Ann Parker, brand new here, and just learned I'm in Ward 7. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Carol, I'm Bob Hooper, and I represent the far new north end. And um... James Sherrard, Ward 4. Thank you. 
just going to pass it down to you folks over there. I'm Philip Peterson. I'm with the Department of Public Works, but I'm also a resident of Ward 7. Hi, Sheila Cooley, uh, also Ward 7, she, her pronouns. Mary Danko, she, her pronouns. I'm director of the Fletcher Free Library, and I also live in Ward 4. <laughs> Joanne Hunt, uh, Ward 4, member of the steering committee. Uh, Gordon Dragoon, he, him pronouns. I live in Ward 4, and I am your Burlington Walk and Bike Council representative. Ashley Dombinsky, Ward 4. Laura Carpentier, Ward 7. Rob Vaughn, Ward 7. Laura McBurney, Ward 4, and the North District City Councilor. Dave Marr, Ward 4, just a regular guy. <laughs> Uh, Lee Morgan, Ward 7, also a regular guy and chair of the Parks Commission. Mark Leopold, Ward 4, and Dave's neighbor, a regular guy. Ward 7, they call me Zeus. Uh, Justin C. Ward 4. I'm Jim Kelly, Ward 7. Um, my wife doesn't like me using this term, but I'm a newsman. <laughs> Patrick Roach, uh, Ward 4. Carol Roach, Ward 4. Pamela Picard, Ward 4. Ray Ingram, Ward 7. Great job, everyone. We've all touched the microphone. It's not that scary. Awesome. Um, Cool. We went over our ground rules and introduced ourselves. So now it is time for open forum. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. And I told you this would happen. <laughs> our folks online. Um, Sylvia, go ahead. We can't hear you yet, Sylvia. There is a little turn up volume. I don't know if that's on the computer. Or... Are you using my arms or not? You are on, Sylvia. You're on now, Sylvia. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Sylvia Hay from Ward 7. And I have a couple of questions about the, the uh, turf playing field at VHS. Okay, well. Um, and then uh, I'm wondering if there, I could get information about discussions about the playing field because. I'm concerned about it um, being a native uh, her and polypropylene substances and uh, old uh, recycled tires with nasty metals in them. Um, and I'm wondering where I can get more information about the discussion that's taken place. Um, there are two people who have responded to to my uh, concern about that. So who should I contact for more information about um, what kind of turf being discussed? I d don't have the answer right now. Let us, Sylvia, that can be our first question on our open forum, which is the next agenda item. I just want to make sure that the other folks online have a chance to introduce themselves. Okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Adam, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, um, Adam Froline, uh, he him pronouns, I live in Ward 4. Um, and again, I'm happy to be here. You know, I think, uh, I hope there's some discussion on when DPOP are talking about kind of safe streets and um, that kind of 
reason I'm here for you know that conversation. So I, I think that's happening when it's for that if it's after that discussion. All right, we hear you. We'll make sure well, there's room for discussion. And is there anyone else online that needs to introduce himself? Jonathan, go ahead. Hi there, John Weber here, I'm, uh, I'm in Ward 4. All right, thank you. All right, so everyone has now introduced himself. Um, and uh, we already had one question um, to start off our open forum from Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, do you, well, I was like, everyone over here good. Sylvia, do you want to ask or raise your concern now that we're moving into our open forum? Okay, sorry. Uh, sure. Um, who can I talk with, uh, or where can I get information about playing fields at VHS? I understand there's a proposal to replace them, and I'm very concerned about the substances that may be used to replace the fields, and how they, how the old one, uh, the old material will be disposed of. <coughs> okay. So who, should I access, uh, find out what kind of discussions have been taking place about this? Monica, you yeah, it sounds like from the Burlington High School. Okay. Monica, do you have a response? Hi, Sylvia. This is Monica Ivancic, uh, member of the school board, and we've uh, emailed back and forth. Um, I don't know specifically what's in it, um, but I know that our superintendent, Tom Flanagan Wood, and director of athletics, Q Corn Pinkney Wood, and I can uh, email you their um, email addresses. Um, but all I know is that um, our turf at the high school uh, football field uh, was grandfathered in uh, to the way they always did turfs in the past. And there is a new PFA's law that came out that was um, that went through the legislature, I believe. Um, but that affects any new turfs um, being built from now on but the BHS turf was grandfathered in to not be affected by this new law. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if this goes in open form or another section, so I'll just throw it out there now. So, um, Unfortunately, I will be moving. I'm staying in Burlington, but unfortunately, unfortunately, the affordability crisis has arrived at my door and I've been priced out, um, which feels very bitter. But I'm making the best of it. I will be in Ward 3, which is great. I'm excited. I will still be coming to NPAs. It's been great getting to know everybody and it's been really great to see the transformation of this NPA. And if I can leave you with one quote, it's my favorite community building quote from Ralph Nader. When strangers start acting like neighbors, communities are reinvigorated. Thank you, Lee. You will be missed in our neighborhood, but happy for your move. New beginnings. You're staying in Burlington. Yeah. So there is an item um, about the traffic pilot. People speak into the microphone so we know what they said. Well, I'm not sure if this is a time where I would speak about it, about the traffic pattern change on the corner of North Avenue and Plattsburgh Avenue, or if that is something a little bit later. It's 7.35 is where it's- I can wait until then then. Steve and then Mike. I would just like to invite everyone here who's interested to uh, Keys Lake Park is having their open house Thursday, October 3rd from 4 to 6.30. They're going to have a Fletcher Free pop-up library there. It's going to be the Conservation Corps headquarters. And I believe the 
the, the uh, community gardens headquarters also, and me and my wife Jane are doing the food. So we were doing homemade pizza, cake like we did tonight, and homemade ice cream, and that will be next Thursday, not this Thursday, but the, uh, October, uh, October 3rd from 4 to 6.30 at Keyslick Park at 311 North Avenue. Thanks for that. Um, just a process question. This is my first NPA meeting. So uh, going on the person who just asked about the traffic situation that it's on the agenda um, is so during that, is it a presentation or a discussion? So will there be time to ask questions then or is it just going to put some info, info out? There will be both. There will be room for um, the department to inform us of the process that they're going through right now and um, built into the time allotted for them is discussion for questions that they can answer. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Joanne, anybody else have any open forum? Perfect. We're going to go back here and then see you. So I'll just I've been asked by Sarah Montgomery, who is with the city clerk's office, to remind or to let everybody know that the Ward 4 polling station has changed for this year. It will not be at St. Mark's. It'll be at Elks Lodge and North Avenue. And feel free to let everybody else who needs to know that know that because we want you to vote. <laughs> Thanks for that. Jim, go ahead, and then I'll see you over there. Okay. And, uh, I'm, I'm Jim Carrier. Uh, my wife is Trisha Carrier. She teaches at Evil and does a building that she was in law program here at the Indian School. Um, I just want to share some good news. I think we came here seven years ago, I guess, eight years, and uh, for her job. And moved into we live on Sky Drive, which is very quiet thanks to the cemetery. We like the cemetery, they're good neighbors. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we've noticed is the influx of folks from um, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, and a lot of young families with children. We know we have children playing in the street. Um, you know, and I, I worry about that, but it's pretty quiet on Sky Drive. But anyway, I think the diversity is occurring in this island neighborhood over there, and I think it's a great thing. And, I unfortunately don't see, except when we work the election, I don't see many of these folks in this building. And, and, and it would be great if they got, could get involved with this uh, update as well. Thank you, Jim. And then we had someone right over here. Oh. Hi, I'm Susan Ogden, and I am very concerned about the proliferation of the deer. Um, the deer in our neighborhood have doubled in the last year. And I would like to know where to go or who to talk to about a study of how the deer are proliferating and what can be done about it, if anything. I'd also like to give a plug to Birding to Change the World, <laughs> well, which is Trisha Kane's book. And it's the book selection of the New North End. And it's really fabulous. So. Meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. At Boca. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyone has any uh, suggestions about where to go to talk about the deer? Okay, I was gonna say, I'll throw that out there. Oh wait, let me grab you the microphone so that it's on the... Charlie wants to make sure he hears it later, you know? Um, the Burlington Conservation Board, they have discussed it. So if you go on to the Boards and Committees website for the City of Burlington, and I will be honest, the City of Burlington's website is being updated, so it might look kind of all over the place. Um, you'll see the Conservation Board, they meet the first Sunday, or not Sunday, nobody meets on Sunday, um, the first Monday of each month um, in the evening, and there is a Zoom option that you can join. Great, thanks for that, Hannah. Um, any other burning topics folks want to bring up during open forum right now? Anybody online? Hmm? Okay, yeah. Vicky? Sorry. Let me get you a microphone. Thank you. I forgot your name. The gentleman with the hat on. Jim, I appreciate your sentiment, and I think that historically, we haven't cultivated and taken accountability and responsibility for creating an environment where people uh, of diverse backgrounds feel comfortable coming 
And I think that's something that we have to be intentional about moving forward. And, um, but I appreciate you bringing it up and I don't want it not to be um, held in a way that it deserves to in this space. So if any folks have ideas or want to participate in ways of creating uh, an environment in the NPA environment that is more inclusive, we would love your engagement and involvement. So thank you for your comment. Thank you. I might just leave this over here. Hi. Um, I'm over on the um, Santa Fe Road, and in the evenings, we have some very fast drivers as well as motorcycle riders. And I would love to hear people's ideas as to how we can get this taken care of and reduced, hopefully eliminated, because it's even past eight, uh, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock, one in the morning. So I would love to have ideas. Oh. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe I read today or yesterday that the city of Burlington is lowering the city's speed limit from 25 to 20. Just in the designated downtown district. I'm sorry? Yeah. Only in the designated downtown district. Just ah, in the designated well, downtown district. Let's talk district. about expanding it. <laughs> Thanks for that input. Yep. Right. It's about the hours as well. One more piece of input. Well, I'll let you know, if you've been up or down Goss Court lately, there's some serious speed bumps, and they work. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. If you haven't, try them out. <laughs> They're quite the ride. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, definitely some good topics. Thank you, everyone, for bringing those up. Uh, one more ask if anyone has anything for open forum before we move on, on the agenda. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, one more. Yeah, I just have uh, for the bike specialists in, in, in the room, uh, uh, traffic calming on the bike path, uh, excessive numbers of bicycles and speeders and non-compliance with signs. Thanks, Rick. One more. All right. Hi, um, I'd just like to mention that my wife and I were on the bike path uh, last week and the week before, a couple weeks before, and uh, I'm at this point getting to the feeling that there needs to be a speed limit on the bike path. We were passed up by some people on regular pedal bikes. They were very fancy looking road racers with, you know, all the, the gizmos, you know, and the special helmets and they were, and then there are some people on some some electrical vehicles that I've never seen before, both standing and uh, all various configurations, one wheels, two wheels, things like that, or sitting and riding, and they had to be going, because I, I looked at my speedometer, I have an electric bike, and I follow behind my wife, and she doesn't speed, but I was doing about 12, and they had to be doing three times my speed, literally, I'm not making that up. So uh, it, it is a half, and they were going in and out of crowds with kids and dogs and everything, so, it looks to me like it's going to be really bad when it first hits. So if it could be avoided, I, I, I'm talking about the bike path. Yeah, yeah, from North Avenue to uh, Winooski River. The water path. So we got time for one more from Susan. Thank you. I want to address the comment about the bike path. Um, uh, last year, the Parks Department put in signs calling for etiquette on the bike path, which are almost unreadable. Um, and I went to local motion last year and submitted a proposal for a safety and etiquette education project um, about the speeding and about the signaling, which is completely lacking in Burlington. Uh, and they were very interested in, and this year when I approached them again, they said 
they were not going to do anything about it. So I think uh, if we want to do something about it, we're going to have to pressure every stakeholder. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can push local motion um, and other stakeholders. Everybody that rents bikes in the area has a stake in, in safety. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Timekeeper, we still have a little time, right? Rick, you have one more comment for our open forum? Yeah, the, uh, the other thing with the bikes on the bike path is there's organizations, and they're doing good stuff. I mean, they're doing stuff for charity. To understand that. But on the same token, when you get bicyclists that are coming through in the Tour de France mode, and I'll be honest with you, I had a gentleman ran a stop sign just as I was coming up the road and ran right into my truck. Okay, luckily he survived, wasn't injured, and he admitted his fault because he was a person of integrity. But if he hadn't been a person of integrity, that would have been on me. So now there's yellow signs to caution people going on the bike path at each of the roads. I asked for parking signs in a parking lot. I was told there's rules that apply. These signs were up in less than two weeks after complaints. So the organizations, getting back to that, the organizations that do these charitable runs, they're great. But the problem is you get 35 bicyclists or 20 bicyclists or whatever going across the road, they don't stop, they don't pay attention, they don't put a road, like in the military we call it a road guard, to block things out. So those are just some things that we have to be you know, aware of. If they have road guards out and it's a big group, fine. But you know, maybe we can put something like that out there. So um, the other thing that I'm not sure is captured because of confidentiality is how many people end up in the hospital or the intensive care unit. I worked there for many years and I have taken care of a lot of bicyclists that um, sometimes got pushed off the bike path or fell. And I'm not sure we're capturing all that because I think, um, I think there's more than people realize. Thanks for that conversation. I just want to go to the one person online who wanted to chime in during open forum who hasn't spoken yet. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, can you help me? I, I assume you can hear me, so I'm going to keep talking. So I am a, I'm a year round by a commuter, so obviously, you know where I stand in the conversation of, uh, of kind of like bike infrastructure, but I 100% agree. The bike path needs to be figured out to make it a safer uh, zone for everyone. There's many bikes that are being unsafe. There's many cars that are um, unsafe on roads. So I think we have to talk about safety from both perspectives. And I think one of the biggest things that I would like to talk about, hopefully, um, that will happen today, maybe later, is I think the bike path is designed for failure with stop things for uh, you know the greenway for pedestrians and yield signs for traffic. And that sets everyone up for um, dangerous encounters. Thanks, Adam. We had another person online who wanted to speak. Go ahead, Deb. And then if we have time, we'll get to you. Actually, I don't. I just wanted to say hi, I guess. Hi, Deb. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more. Um, but I'm going to go with someone who hasn't spoken. Uh, um, so I just want to join in on the bike path as well. Um, I agree with the last person who spoke that I think it's designed it's flipped on its head a bit. Um, like I, I think it's more natural for bikes to be allowed through the intersections and for cars to stop. Um, like I've crossed a bunch of times and I've seen people speed on the bike side, but like then on the other side of that, when you're biking, you have a lot less ability to get back up to speed. Whereas with a car, it's a lot easier. Um, I also think that there's not really good visibility on a lot of these crossings. Um, there are trees basically right up to the corner where the road meets the bikeway. And I think if we can move those back so drivers can get a little more view as well as the bicyclists, it will help across the board. Thanks, Justin. We have 30 seconds, so I wanted to allow Jonathan online just to chime in with his open forum. 
Thanks. I just wanted to um, speak to the discussion about the bike path and the intersections. One of the things that I think I do support the idea of uh, a yield and making the streets a stop, especially because the the bike path crossings are the crosswalks, so they are a yield for people walking and people walking at the right and the crossing, but they're not a yield for people biking. So it's just a confusing situation, I think, um, making the path a yield and the streets a stop would make things a lot clearer for everybody. Thanks, Jonathan. Fruitful discussion. Timekeeper, how we doing? Um, we are all set. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for all the input on um, the bike path and the other issues that came up during Open Forum. Um, I think a lot of people who are in this room who are involved in biking council will take that to note. <laughs> Looking over here. Um, but we will have to move on um, to our next point on the agenda. Um, and that is Mary Janko from the Fletcher Free Library to inform us about some of the offerings and what's going on. Thank you so much. Is it okay? Is here good? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, September is national, um, not national, but September is library card sign up month. So I'm here to encourage you, if you don't have one, to get a library card. Uh, for some of you, you may know this already, but the library has really two manifestations. We have our bricks and mortar place, right? So we've got one downtown and we have our new North End branch as well. And you can come in there and uh, at, well, you know, use uh, physical books. You can check those out. We have library of things that you can check out. We have a food dehydrator, shovels, rakes, uh, cake pans, uh, laptops, hotspots, uh, computer center where you can get access to the internet. And of course, when you go into any of our library branches, our lovely librarians are there to help you with whatever you need. And we also have our online uh, part of the library, which is all the online services that we offer, which is downloadable audiobooks, downloadable ebooks, access to consumer reports, access to New York Times. For some of you that might um, have uh, connections into other nonprofits you might be interested. We have a new online uh, service and you, ha you have to come into the library to use it, but it's called Foundation Candid Foundation Directory and you can do search for grants for different, um, all kinds of grants if you're in a nonprofit and you're looking for something. And again, a librarian can help you with all of that. So uh, my uh, Talk is very brief, but I also am happy to answer any questions in my remaining few minutes that I have. If anyone has any questions, I can bring the mic over to them for Mary while she's here. And I don't keep track of who has overdue library books, so <laughs> don't worry this about that. This is a that safe space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank you so much for the North Avenue branch. I mean, my neighbors and I love it. We're in there all the time. Jeff is great. Yes, we love we love Jeff. I have an amazing staff. Thank you. Uh, Mary, I wanted to, uh, to remind them also of the movie uh, access you can have through the, um, through, through, uh, Canopy? Canopy. Yes. Uh, I use it all the time. Oh, that's so great to hear. Yes. And again, for all of these, all you need is your library barcode number and your PIN number. But Canopy, is you can stream movies. There's lots of great documentaries, foreign films, all kinds of wonderful things. We're just adding a new service called Biblio Plus, and that's going to have some more online um, things that you can access as well. So we're always looking to expand and we're always looking for your input for things that you think that we should be doing. So just feel free always to reach out to me if you need something. Uh, uh, thanks, Mary. And I just wanted to add that you can also access consumer reports via the library online. And so if you're planning to buy an, a new appliance, a new car, whatever, check out consumer reports. You don't have to pay for it. Yep, it's a great service. We have something called Gale Databases, which gives all kinds of access. We don't keep uh, paper copies of newspapers and magazines anymore. We just don't have 
have the space for that, and we don't need to because it's all digitized. So we have an online resource that can get you all kinds of back issues to probably anything that you can think of. And some of you may know this already, but I'll just say it just in case. Even if we don't have something, we can usually interlibrary loan it from another library. So even if it's some weird, obscure article that you read four years ago, uh, we, we love to track those kinds of things down. Um, and we love to help you with your research. And I, I just want to thank you again, but also add a public health piece. They have free COVID tests there. Yes, it's really, really. I love this group. Helpful. You guys are doing a job for me. We do. We have. We have. We have so many things there. Yes, and we do have free COVID tests. We have boxes and boxes of them to get us through the winter. Any other questions, Vicky? You have one, and then uh, someone in the corner. I just got really excited because I listen to audiobooks from the library, but you said downloadable. Yes. Is that true? Yes. So some, <laughs> some of them you don't, like you can download them and so you don't have to have the, the Wi-Fi access for it. Oh, so some, not all. Yeah. How do, how do I know? Are you, are, <laughs> I'm so excited. I, you know, and this is a really good point. So uh, again, a lot of them are apps. So one of the apps is Libby. I have it. Yep. I didn't know I could download. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's, yeah. Yep. And we had one more comment. Hi, Mary. Um, downtown, you have um, laptops you can take out along with internet access devices. Hotspots, yep. Hotspots. At some point, will you be able to have those devices, the access devices, hotspots, and laptops at the North Avenue branch? Yes, we are looking to expand that. And um, I can't say keep it in the vault because like we're being uh, <laughs> taped right now. But we are hoping to expand uh, new North End hours as well. We are in, in big talks to make some changes to have more hours open there. And, and so we can expand the services. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, and one more question or comment from Jim. Um, difficult issue, but uh, could you just brief us how you're doing with the issue of the homeless and other folks who are gathering around the library? The last time I think I thought it was much improved. You have you know, uh, have a security guy that's checking through the, the building, and um, what's what's the status of it right now? Because at the last police or city council meeting, people. This was disturbing to me. There was a woman who actually said, I, I'm afraid to take my daughter there, uh, so we're going to start going to the South Burlington Library. I personally don't feel um, afraid to go in there with the people hanging out, but what, what, give us a, a snapshot of what, what's been done and what your plans are. Sure. And, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some challenges that we're seeing down, the, you know, downtown downtown, especially around the library. We do have full-time security uh, when we're open, uh, and we do our very, very best to monitor the spa space both inside and outside the library when we're open. I think the ch challenge that I hear a lot from folks is sometimes they're coming to drop their books off in the book drop when we're not open, and we just don't have 24-hour security. So. Sometimes when you're coming up to use the book drop when we're closed, you are seeing folks who are really, um, really suffering some, some hard times right now. You know, we're seeing folks in the grips of addiction like we've never seen before, people who really are having, you know, many, many different challenges. Um, during the day, we work very close with the Howard Street Outreach folks to get people the help they need. We work with the Burlington Police Department CSLs to help get folks the help that they need, but we do have requirements about behavior in the library and around the library. Um, you cannot be under the influence when you're on library property, either inside or outside. And uh, it's not because we're trying to be, you know, super harsh or punitive, but we do have people who are in recovery that come to use the library. I may even have staff who are in recovery, so we have to keep that a substance-free space. So we work very, very hard to do that. Uh, some days it's more challenging than others. Our security guards are doing the rounds, both inside and outside, and staff are also trained to you know, be on the lookout for behavior um, that isn't, you know, 
the, the library has to be welcoming to everybody. And so we work really hard to keep that, to keep the behavior in a way so that everybody can use it. But um, sometimes what we're seeing downtown is, is very sad, you know, and it's very um, uncomfortable for some folks, uh, but we do, we do our best. Um, and, you know, we have had, you know, sometimes the security will say, you know, security has escorted people to their cars if they need that. Um, I, I just, I think what we're seeing is just a lot of sadness. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get through it. But right now we're just doing our best. Sounds like that's our timekeeper. That's, um, that's, a, that's a lovely sound. Very much appreciate you. Very much appreciate you here, Mary, for all that information. And Thank thanks you very much. Your questions. And we'll move on to our next agenda point and invite Philip um, from the Burlington Department of Public Works. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm Philip Peterson, uh, Senior Transportation Planner with the Department of Public Works, and this is going to be kind of the express version of this presentation. We're not tone deaf to what folks really want to talk about, which is the North Ave Plattsburgh pilot. So I'm going to kind of fly through some of this material. The material will be NPA, and it will be accessible to all of you. My contact information will be there as well. So you can reach out to me after if there's any particular item that I didn't cover well before that we can talk about later. So let's get into it. These are the things that we're going to discuss. I'm going to start with BTV one bike action. That's happening. Um, we've made progress. We need to make more progress. And that's what the purpose of the plan is. And we also need to update it every five years. There will be a public meeting October 21st at Contours Auditorium at 6 p.m. Uh, there's a QR code here for a survey. Again, I'm going to share with the NPA and you can take it later. Um, Office of City Planning was going to come tonight. They bowed out. Just know that Plan BTV New North End is underway and on its way. And I'm sure there's going to be more conversations about that. Uh, Ethereum Parkway traffic calling. We received a notification that we were awarded a grant to proceed with traffic calling on Ethan Allen Parkway. Construction will proceed uh, starting next spring. More to come with that. Just to kind of cover that 20 mile per hour zone, um, that is not citywide. It is within the designated downtown district. So the, the blank outline in the map on the right hand side, that is the designated downtown district. Um, to answer that gentleman's question earlier, we cannot under current state law, go less than 25 miles per hour on any other city street. You can't get a designated downtown district, but you can't do it anywhere else. Okay, other thing we want to talk about is traffic calming. We have a slug of traffic calming requests in the city of Burlington, close to 60 now. It's more than 56 now, it's more like 58. Uh, we know that folks are, they really want to see traffic calming on different city streets. Um, it's expensive. We're limited on funds. We're limited on staff. So what we've done this summer is we've explored some logistical, kind of easier, low-cost, effective rubber speed humps. And we piloted on three different locations throughout the city. One is Grove Street, which is an arterial, higher volume street, which is in the older city, that's a collector, and then Goss Court, which is low volume. So it gives us an idea on how these different traffic calming features will work, collected data, speed, noise monitoring. We are kind of have an idea on where these will work and where they probably won't work and what we'll try next year, because we will try other things. And in terms of cost, an asphalt speed time costs between thirty and forty thousand dollars. This entire project costs less than $17,000 to do those three streets. So it's a very cost-effective solution, and we're able to respond to the traffic calming needs. We've done some pilot projects in the new North End. Oh, hello. Um, which was very popular with local residents in this area. Um, and we've received requests from other neighborhoods that do not have sidewalks that, hey, can we do that as well? There's also the new North End Sidewalk Scooping Study, but we'll talk about that later. And we will proceed with more of a robust conversation around Plattsburgh. 
sidewalk scoping study is a project happening right now. QR code, another survey. I know you guys probably all love QR codes. Um, so again, we'll view this later. Now, let's slow down for a second. Just take a breath. I'll get into North Ave and Plattsburgh. Just a quick anecdote. Hey, I went to Bush Court. And when my engineer and I, Julia Zaki, talked about this project, we were both like, yes, yeah, good project, good idea. I brought it home. I told my wife. And she said, you're not. She was up in South Hill as a nurse. She's the charge nurse for CHC. And so this has been very popular for me to go. Let me tell you something, folks. Yes. Physical safety. And we're going to the crash data. That's the next slide. A major speeding condition there. The 85th percentile speed is 37 miles per hour. Just like the you know, 85th percentile speed it gives us a taste of what driving is on that street. And as a pedestrian in a high pedestrian area, the survivability rate of an accident or a crash there pretty low. So street safety concern. So it's vehicle safety, right? We're slowing cars down. It's pedestrian safety. And yes, it's continuing the bike network, connecting the bike network. Because right? there's a 200 foot gap. We have a bike, we got a bike lane, and then it gets cut off. There was a quarter for paving. There's a paving project. So the cost of this is $1,000 because we're with another project. The big cost with some of these projects is more demobilization and demobilization of a contractor. So we do this project separately, it costs big dollars. It's already there. They're already doing the project. They have a contractor that's willing to do it. So let's let's look at it. This project was recommended in 2017. So to be honest with you, we're kind of seven years behind in proceeding with the work. So the crash data. So on the side, we got crashes from 2015. You can barely see it. I'll tell you this way. I'll get this later. There's crash history at this intersection. There's crash history with injuries at this intersection. The data tell this to folks, but the data tell the story. Personality here, just the principles of the data that we're looking at. And that's what we have to look at. We got data, we got speed data, we got crashes, and we have an incomplete bike network. Using to do after the pilot, data continues to show what we're seeing. To install continuous bike network. To install a bike lane, remove a right turn lane, and some bollards for protection for pedestrians and bicyclists. Now, it's going to take up too much time. I can play it. This was first installed during student dismissal. And this is what we saw as engineers. And what you see is yes, the cars do back up. But the queue is clear. What's a queue? A queue is when you have a stack of cars that are all stopped. And if it clears, that means all the vehicles clear without having to stay for another cycle. Now, let's talk about some of the other data that we've seen when we've been out there as engineers. The EVP queues did not say one to not clear as engineers going out and collecting data. And by the way, we're going to keep collecting data. We're going to continue to monitor. We're not just, you know, doing it a few times and saying no. We're not. We're not coming back. PQs, five percent are clearing. It showed a consistent slowdown at the eight a.m. time between seven fifty-five and eight ten. We had a five-minute delay one day. We had a twenty-minute delay the other. Beyond that, queues before seven fifty all cleared. And queues after 8.10 and 8.15 cleared. Queues, it's a slowdown, and really, it's unaffected by the right turn configuration anyways. So what's the next steps? Starting to know. Construction activities. We'll continue to observe. 
and then a final decision will be made. I have set up a virtual meeting on October 9th at 730. There's a kid there I'm trying to find a space. So it'll be a virtual meeting and hopefully a space so people can talk to us. And then we'll talk about what we found, what our final analysis is, and hear from you folks. And with that, I hope I gave us enough time. Thank you, Philip. Any uh, initial feedback and questions? Rick, we'll start here and Pam after that. Uh, has any previous study been done on this during the winter? With snow? And where's it going to go? Where's the snow going to go? I mean, the snow would, that would definitely be a consideration. I mean, just like any big claim, um, you know, with bollards, we'd have to use sidewalk tractors to do snow removal. Um, we're always in conversations with our streets, folks around snow removal. It's definitely not a secondary consideration. I've already been talking to, to Jason Wimbley this morning about it, and they feel like they can do it. Thanks, Philip. Thanks for that, Philip. We've got a question over here. A few questions on a few statements. So you state that it's not adding any extra time to commutes. It is. It's adding extra time for people trying to get out of the side streets. It's adding extra time for people trying to get into the side streets. People are having a hard time getting in and out of the mobile shortstop. Your dominoes, any of the other businesses, because traffic is backing up. Franklin Square people are going to have an issue because nobody's going to abide by that blocked off area. Things like this have to be addressed and looked at too. So if businesses, people can't get in and out of the businesses, they're not going to stop. They're going to take a dramatic hit in their business and their revenue. Have we thought about any of that? I mean, and it does affect people going southbound because they can't turn left onto a side street. They can't get around vehicles because you've taken away our extra lane or the bike lanes. I understand they want a continuation of the bike lane, but if they're going straight, they should be in the straight lane. Uh, just to address that, um, I've gone to Domino's Pizza pretty much every night when it's been installed, talked to almost all the drivers, spoke to the owner, uh, one of their managers came and spoke at the commission last week. We've been in contact with him, Gordon. Um, gone and had a couple of conversations with Dave Hartnett at the store. Um, we've been in conversations with folks. I made a lot of anecdotal observations. I live three blocks away, walk my dog there all the time. And um, I guess I could say, like, I'm looking for this. You know what I mean? I'm looking for problems. I really am. And I'm, and I'm looking to find those major backups and major problems because I live here. And this is one of those situations where like, okay, this is a project in another part of town. And no, I didn't like, I live with my wife. And if it's a major problem, like I'm not afraid, I'm afraid of her. So. And it, you're, you're doing your study for a week or two. And it's not going to be a long period of time where you're going to notice like people are eventually going to be like, I can't get in out of the short stop. I'm going to go to another store down the road. It's not going to it's not going to show in their revenue at this point in time. It would show six months from now when people are like, I'm not going there because I can't get out. Right. They're going to you're not looking at that point of it. It's also affecting people trying to get the children to school on time. You have two children, two different schools. We don't have an extra 12 minutes to sit in traffic. We don't. I mean, if you look at the new North End Facebook page, there is a poll right now. 89% of the people that answered that poll, they do not want that lane to leave. Right, right. And and I would say I would hope that those all those people would come and talk to us directly. I, I would appreciate just direct conversation. I don't need anybody on the street and talk about this. Thanks, Philip. We have someone online who's hoping to ask a question. Um, Jonathan, and then I had Jim, and then I had Lee, and then I had Justin. We have 11 minutes and 50 seconds left. Right, thank you. Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, so I bike for transportation. I also drive. Um, just really want to express appreciation for this safety improvement that DPW is making at the intersection. Um, I think it's going to make uh, using the Plastic Ave crosswalk and the North Ave bike lane a lot easier and safer to use. 
Um, as a driver, it really feels like this intersection is pretty overbuilt. The speeds are really high. Um, and it's encouraging a lot of aggressive turning. That's just not appropriate for a street like North Ave. Um, so I doubt there's going to be much additional delay, and I'm, I'm glad to deal with it if there is as a driver. Um, so thanks, DPW, and looking forward to see this become permanent. Thanks, Jonathan. Let me go over here to Jim. It looks much better. So it's always a challenge, but thank you for the input. Thanks, Jim. Hey there, uh, Lee Morgan. So something I've, I think I, I'm observing and observing here tonight, you're going to keep having people telling you that they're experiencing long wait times. Would it be helpful for you for people who are experiencing these backups if they safely record it? Would you accept recordings? Um, that's, yeah. Um, and yeah, as someone who drives that route um, every day, several times a day, and uh, has used that crosswalk, I was having to, that was scary for me when I was having to use that crosswalk a lot. I, I had a little chant I would do that this is safe, this is safe, because I felt very unsafe. Um, and driving, I, I mean, and maybe it's the times I'm going through. I haven't experienced having to wait longer than one um, light cycle, um, but that's my experience. So, right. so yeah, I guess just I, I would encourage people if you are experiencing these things that the the engineers and people that work at the department aren't seeing. I think it is helpful to record. It's probably the best. Happy to take any and all input. Thanks, Justin. And then I have a couple people online, and then I'll. So first off, I always appreciate data-driven approaches. So, um, makes it a lot easier to um, deal with. Um, I just had a more general question. When you're looking at expanding the bike path, how are you going about choosing routes? Um, because one of the things, I just moved here from Seattle, and one of the things that I experienced in Seattle was when we were building out our bike routes, um, they were being co-located on main thoroughfares, and that was contributing to major traffic buildups over time because all of the major streets were getting co-located with bike routes. So that North Ave New North End is kind of a strange creature. Chapin and I were talking about this earlier. There's not a lot of ways in and out, right? Um, so you're talking about like greenways. We have. Uh, a couple of those projects that we've done in the old North End, the what was called the old North End Greenway or the Wiggle, which connects basically a waterfront battery park area all the way to the university campus. And it's on side streets, stride roads that are calmer, volume streets, um, and it takes them off of like a Pearl Street or something like that. If I say about transportation design, it's all about space. And we're in Burlington. We have a very small right of way, don't have a lot of space to work with. And once you start getting into like curve moving and all of that, it gets very expensive. Thanks for the question. I wanted to invite a couple of people online, um, Adam and then Deb to answer uh, to ask a question and then we'll get back to the folks here. So Adam, go ahead. Um, yeah, so the the one piece that I will add to just as a um a, an avid bike commuter, I think the importance of safety and um and design is, is very key for actually increasing bikership which then has a reduction in traffic 
Um, another piece too is the, I know many folks that I talk to are not um, bike commuters feel you know frustrated with bikers when, when there's maybe moves that happen that put a, a driver at risk. But I think the thing we have to remember is these streets are narrow without proper builds, um, close encounters happen and um, bikes getting hit by cars results in serious injury and death. Cars often do not uh, walk away with much damage. So I think we have to think about these like um, equity in the roads just because there's less bikes doesn't mean that it's less important for that mode of transportation. And also um, if you build good things, there's gonna be more ridership. And I think that's gonna be something that um, is important for the city, it's important for everyone. And I hope this moves forward and um, a little bit of a weight in a line is um, a trade off for safe biking. Uh, I'll take that every day. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Deb, go ahead with your question. I thanks everyone. Um, I too want to endorse what you're doing um, with this pilot, at least. Um, the one thing I was noticing today was the traffic backup on. Um, Oh my gosh, what's the name of the road that we're all turning on to? Plattsburgh Ave, um, from from the Beltline to get to North Avenue, and I'd gone that way. I'm driving um, to avoid all the road construction, and as soon as I turned on to Plattsburgh, the the traffic was backed up almost to um, 127, and it took me 20 minutes to get up to North Avenue to turn right. Um, and not even go where the uh, construction was going. So I was going to suggest and wonder if it's possible, at least during this uh, construction period, that you temporarily turn Turf Road into a two-way street so people could turn off of Plattsburgh and get onto the northern part of North Avenue without having to go wait that long and then turn um, so that's my suggestion. And I just wanted to add one thing, which is if people are on Zoom can't hear you when you talk above the mic or down into it, if you hold the mic right in front of your face and talk into the side of it, um, we can hear you. It, otherwise, it just breaks up. So thank you. Thanks for that, Deb. Uh, I want to invite Gordon to give some feedback. I'm going to try to talk into the side of the mic here. Into the mic, that was great. Oh, God, I already messed it up. Uh, I'm not so good off the cuff, so I tried to take some notes. Um, it's my understanding that, correct, first of all, I just want to say that this was like a great presentation, and I saw the posts on the Facebook group as well. And this is like jumping into the lines, then. So I just like to commend you guys for coming. Uh, I also really do support this policy. I think it's vital to connect all of our bike transportation. Cars have been in a privileged position for quite a while, even with this, with a slowdown, if that is something that's going to be happening during peak hours, it wasn't really possible to bike through for someone that isn't comfortable driving alongside cars going 37 miles per hour at the 85th percentile. If we're concerned with people getting their children to schools, driving from one to the other, their cars cost $10,000 a year plus to maintain. Some people are too poor. Some people are too young to be able to take cars as transit. There are kids that are going to be biking to schools as well. And I think that they probably would appreciate not having to share car, uh, a road with a car going 37 miles per hour. Um, I had more, but I feel like I can talk for a while. So thank you. Um, I saw some hands. There was is Dave, and then I saw Caleb over here, and I don't remember your name, but as well. So my question is, how will you determine if the pilot is a success? Do you have preset hard criteria based on quantitative data, or will it be more qualitative and touchy-feely? No, it's, it's, it's data-driven, so this is what's called the level of service. A level of service is a grading similar to like arithmetic, you know, A, B, C, D, F. Uh, currently, that intersection has a level of service of a pool. Um, we projected it with our software, dropped all sorts of data and software called SIPL, and projected that after installation of the project, it would remain a level of service of B. And we found that, and we have collected so it is still a level of service of a B. Uh, safety. I just think is right here. 
If you don't catch this, call DPW customer service. I'll be out there tomorrow in the afternoon counting cues. You can join and I'll show you how to do it. And I'm happy to meet with you at any time to talk it through. Thank you so much, Philip. And yeah, I know there's a couple meetings coming up. I don't know if you wanted to repeat when those are so folks have another chance to talk with you in right. person. And send us in the back, Karen. Sorry um, to anyone who didn't have a chance. The action plan, um, we have partners that are helping us manage that. That's going to be October 21st at 6 o'clock at Con 20. Please come to that. Um, there's also, I'm going to be hosting um, on this once we have to make kind of a final determination and recommendation as far as what it is that we do. Um, I don't have a specific spot for that, but it'll be um, at 7.30 p.m. and two will be there. Okay, so yeah, October 9th, virtual meeting. Yes. So thank you for everyone who brought their questions and concerns to Philip. Thank you, Philip, for this presentation. And good to know there's uh, more opportunity for conversation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And we will move along to our next agenda point. I wanted to invite James Sherrard um, up to chat about the Star Farm Road traffic issues. There's a microphone there for you. I think presentation for that no, um, uh, introducing myself james shard ward for resident um off of star farm road uh i pulled together a little powerpoint presentation to sort of talk through this one slide i was remiss in putting in there is acknowledgments i requested to have this time to speak um, a while back and since then the city has actually met with myself and other residents and that includes chapin and philip and others and um mark our ward for uh, North District Counselor. So a whole bunch of folks have met and talked with us about this. That's really positive. We really appreciate it. I didn't put that in my slideshow. So thank you. Um, that being said, we still wanted to take this time we had, and we am speaking for the way of the community members that have sort of been pushing me into this position. Um, but I'd love to tell you all a little bit about Star Farm Road and why we think there's a traffic uh, safety issue and we can perhaps work towards improving that. So that's me. Hi. Perfect. Um, Looks like we got really cool formatting errors, which I love. That's cool. I think we can talk through it. This is really an online issue. Uh, I will also just like um, share real briefly that I moved in about four years ago to this community. Uh, a few other community members who lived there for much longer than me um, have sort of come up to me and say, I'm, I'm too tired to, to deal with this anymore. We think there's an issue, but we've sort of lost our oomph. So sort of picking up um, where some other folks left off that says being an issue has, I guess, been on our local radar for quite some time. Um, and now we're just hoping to sort of take it to the next level. And you can break it into a few different categories. Um, the, the frequent stop sign violations is specifically for the, I'll call it a four-way intersection, understanding that's not technically what it is, but at the Star Farm Park entrance, the, the children's and uh, sports park, not the dog park. Uh, high speeds, so um, pretty much from that uh, that park all the way to Flint Elementary is, is what we call like a straightaway or a racetrack. You know when people are speeding on it, it happens somewhat frequently, um, and a lot of folks are concerned about that. That dovetails into the lack of bike infrastructure. This picture was taken by another community member. I I don't know their last name. I think it was Renee, Renee Lauber. Um, she, she wanted to pass this along, snap this picture. Um, for those online, you can see that there's children biking on the sidewalk, children biking on the road, there's a car, there's pedestrians walking. This just kind of gets to the point that there's um, no really great bike access on this route, and yet it's the direct connector from the bike path to Flynn Elementary. So just flagging this as another community resource. Thank you. Speaking of community resources, I kind of wanted to lay them out from um, uh, west to east. And yes, I recognize I'm a resident here, so I'm like really highly invested in what the outcome of this discussion and this in this effort is. Um, and it's a dead end road, so a lot of you might be thinking, obviously, the Plattsburgh and, uh, intersection is more important, and you might be right. However, on this road, sort of going like I said, west to east, we have the community gardens access to the bike path. 
we have from that access uh, to the bike path, the, the North Shore area, or we sometimes call it Stairs Beach. Then you have the, uh, the, the playground itself, which is a playground for toddlers, older kids. There's sports fields that are actually actively being used by BHS while that turf field is being reconstructed. So that's like a pretty heavily used area. There's nature trails, um, and then obviously Flynn Elementary. So I kind of wanted to lay out some of these things that pull a lot of people into this area and specifically towards the bike path in that four-way intersection. Great, by the way. Thank you for the note. Um, to reiterate some of our our specific concerns around this four-way intersection, um, it, there's uh, some sidewalks that are losing their paint, kind of crumbling a little bit. Actually, one of the outcomes of the meeting with DPW is they said they would repaint those sidewalks. That's like really appreciated. Thank you. That's going to be a long way. Um, but oh, thank you, Chapin. I I am I am a DPW alum, as Chapin wanted me to say. I used to work for DPW, not ex DPW, and um, obviously I didn't work in the traffic division. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, the sidewalks um, are there, not as visible. But the fact is that a lot of vehicles kind of blow through these stop signs, and this is the point in my presentation where I'm going to say. For many years now, the community members have, have flagged that this is an area of concern. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't work well. We don't know what the exact fix is. We really just want to continue the engagement with the, our community and also our, um, uh, our city leaders to just find the fix. And if one's proposed to us that we haven't really thought about yet, well, we're totally open to it. Um, and it, this has been going for just like a little while. That's my final little a little bit about the community concern. Um, so I'm trying to sort of step in and increase uh, how vocal we're, we're being about this particular issue. Um, hopefully ahead of any particular um, potential accidents. To on the next slide. Yeah, and I just decided to throw some potential risks in there because who doesn't love to talk about potential risks? Um, <laughs> I'm working in four categories, you know, our kids, pedestrian cycles, community safety. Um, the the park that we have there is specifically designed for for toddlers. There's a workout area. It's just a ton of traffic. There's a lot of um, visibility, vegetation that's seen in those crossings. So um, you know, I now have a ten month old. I have a dog. I walk my dog across that crosswalk with a dog steps out in front of me. That's my dog, right? I'm a dog owner. I got to keep the dog on the leash, but the cars always hit them. So there's visibility issues there. There's the fact that a, a soccer ball could go at any particular moment and cars really don't respect the stop signs. So I think that's like the, the central concern when it comes to pedestrians sort of in the same, um, same category as you know, children, but you know, pedestrians may just be trying to use this crosswalk uh, where children may kind of run into it in the, the area um, next to this park. Cyclists, harkening back to that picture I showed, um, the bike path is the direct connector for a lot of communities up and down the bike path to Flynn Elementary. Um, and without the dedicated bike infrastructure on Star Farm, you tend to have this um, passing of pedestrians and bike traffic and just trying to flag down breaks a lot through the stop sign and not just on foot. Uh, I'll actually talk real briefly about the bike path after the slide. Um, and again, this is a community safety component. Just sort of an accident. We've all sort of seen things that were maybe close and just trying to nip that in the bud, get ahead of it. So the proposed measures, fourth by our chief and his team, and Philip um, and, and all the traffic folks, was painting the sidewalks, um, new signage improve, improvements, which means maybe some of the signs that are currently there could be updated, more reflective. Uh, more signage. So one of the examples given was, hey, um, there's a not sidewalk, crosswalk coming up in 200 feet, you know, being aware. Um, and uh, traffic study initiative uh, to be completed by the spring of 2025. We're super grateful for all of that, really looking forward to seeing what comes out of those efforts and hopefully we can get closer to a solution. I wanted to throw out a few alternative measures. Again, we're just sort of flying issue um, and we have open to suggestions. 
Um, and the speed bumps when these are more expensive. I do honestly think putting the speed bumps would solve a lot of the problems um, along the straightaway and the four way intersection. The temporary speed bumps that a lot of us drove on to get here work great. We'd be ecstatic if we got those, even if it's just seasonal. Um, we understand that there are limitations with budget and um, ability to pull those into the city and the quantities needed, but that would be great. Um, traffic coming bump outs along Star Farm Road throughout the city. Folks have probably seen those you know, really curbed bump outs that come out and really slow down traffic. If that's an option that makes sense, um, I think it would slow down those, those uh, faster cars. And then rapid flashing beacons. I, I, I have a question mark here because we'll get to that on our next meeting. There was a conversation about how these stop signs may not be warranted, which is a term I just learned, which means they maybe shouldn't have been put there in the first place. If that's the case and people are going to say they go to just a crosswalk and maybe rapid flashing beacon, I know those are always weird to get, but that could be a really good improvement for the safety of that immediate intersection. Again, there's alternatives, throwing everything out there. In our talk, uh, Director Wright of the BPRW, she brought up the potential for a side path, an intentional connector from the bike path to Flame Island, uh, sorry, to Flame Elementary or close to it. And that yellow highlight that I sort of drew out there, that's not intended to show you where it would be. It's actually going to hug the road if it happens. Long story short, she's, she thinks that a community driven project could get support from BPRW to like widen an actual surface path connecting the bike path to um, the entrance to the a supportive care facility. Um, and that parcel just to the right of uh, the lines is uh, a fleet nav parcel. So he'd be on school district property. So um, really I'm just flagging that because if people want to see something like that, please reach out to BPRW and just let that team know and say, hey, we sort of heard about this. We know what's in its early stages. We know we're just talking about a natural surface path, but I'm assuming the chance of having a dedicated hard skate path, like a path, will be used in the making and need more funding. So soon the, um, the director was very clear to say like, that's not necessarily gonna happen, but many steps, right? So um, next slide, please. This is where I'm going to close. Um, essentially, I'm going into a relatively small community that doesn't have a lot of voices. Um, and there's a barrier to entry for folks to sort of make their voices heard. Some people are frustrated and they start to yell and that doesn't go anywhere. Some people kind of give up because they haven't gotten any action. Um, sort of taking the middle ground here, if we can just get the word out, Anyone else that wants to voice their support for traffic improvements and safety improvements along this corner, which includes my neighbor with um, Little Caesar. Little Caesar's a great dog. If we can get traffic improvements from you know, the bike path all the way up to Fleet Elementary, I think everyone would be um, pretty happy. And it gets, again, it's not just our community, it's everyone who accesses those community um, touch points. Um, so BPRW contact info and traffic calming info on the slide. Thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate it. We have time for a few questions. It looks like we have some hands up in the ground. We've got a few minutes until our next agenda point. Okay, Je is it okay, James? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first off, thank you for this. Um, I live right on Star Farm, uh, about halfway up, and so I regularly bike from the bike path to my house, and I know, especially biking to the bike path um, and being on the right side of the road next to the woods, it feels like the branches push me into the road and the cars push me into the branches. And it, it definitely, like, I do it every day, but it, it doesn't feel necessarily safe. Um, and I do know about the speeding on that road because my bedroom window is open to that road and I hear it all night. So um, it'd be nice to get some, like, as you said, speed bumps on there. Like, generally I'm opposed, but I think there it's fairly warranted. I had a hand over here. Thanks. Um, biking through that area on the Greenway bike path, whatever people want to call it, um, coming from the area of, of Letty Park, I noticed um, along Shore Road 
and Staniford on either side of that area, there were signs on the road uh, right on either side, letting people know about, letting the cars know about the bikes coming through. And when I got to Star Farm Road, there was only one sign coming up Star Farm Road. And on the other side, there was no sign. For some reason, it was never installed. So this summer, within the past few months, I called into Public Works. And after calling and leaving a message, I finally decided to call back and ask for someone who was in, sign, in charge of street signs for the city of Wellington. And I spoke to a man named Al. And I convinced him to come down. I explained there was a sign missing, like Shore Road and Stanford, and there was only one coming up along Star Farm Road. And within a few days, there was now a second sign to match Shore Road and Stanford, and there's now a sign like the one coming up Star Farm Road on the other side of the bike path. For, st for cars coming down Star Farm Road to match that. So there's an improvement for you. Thanks for that feedback. <laughs> All right. Um, Rick, you want to throw something in before we close you out? Yeah, so uh, as far as the traffic uh, issue with vehicle speeding, uh, I do community watch. I go through the three parking lots community gardens, the uh, dog park, and Star Farm. And there's a lot of drug trafficking and all kinds of other stuff that was going on there. This year, it hasn't been quite so bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've seen a significant improvement uh, as far as uh, other than two stolen cars that I got uh, recovered for their owners. Uh, but other than that, it's been pretty quiet. I haven't picked up any needles this year, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the speeding that occurs late at night is are the ones that come in. Uh, there should be, there should have been a noticeable reduction in the traffic speeders. Um, they also speed out of the parking lot. Uh, I they have a time limit. It goes from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. or 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. that they can't be in that parking lot at Star Farm Park. But once once I get there, well. <laughs> You know, they got to go, you know, and many of them are or or drinking one or the other. So, you know, there ain't much I can do about that. But I do discourage them from going in. Uh, I am adamantly against the speed bumps and anything else on that road. Most of the traffic that's during the day goes to the residences that are either um, some people aren't going to like this, but I call them imports. These are people who have moved here from out of state, and now I've lived here all my life, okay? So I've ridden my bicycle all over this, this city and the other townships around here. And my rule of thumb is, that's a car, and this is the law. If you stop for a stop sign, that's the law. That's what I did as a kid. That's what I see young children at the stop signs on the bike path doing and saying to their parents, mommy, please stop. That's a stop sign. Daddy, please stop. It's a stop sign. These are 10 and 12 year old kids. So as far as that goes, it's also the law. Okay. That's, it, it, there's no discussion to go beyond that. The traffic that comes through during the day is mostly people from out of state who have moved here recently and they're either getting settled in, taking their time, but driving like crazy fools, or their beach residences, same thing, with events. And there are people that don't know the road or the conditions. The idea of the bike path running up the side of the sports fields and all that, great idea. And the best thing we could do there is bulldoze it, just make it nice and wide, give you a dirt path, literally. You, take, you just make a dirt path up through Star Farm parking lot, the, the park parking lot, bulldoze right up through. It's all leased property. That gets you up to the school, and then you, you know, might have to put a little bit of uh, sherp back down all the way up you know, to where the, the, the school parking lot is. But the, uh, the stop signs and all this other stuff, 
if you're obeying the law, you're not going to have an issue. The, the, the other thing that does occur is runners on the bike path. They piggyback on walkers and then and bicyclists do the same thing. They piggyback, next thing you know, they're out in the middle of the road. No respect for the law. All right, sounds like we got some options. Oh, is Dan, Dan back online? I know we, did, we missed you last time, Dan, so why don't you go ahead and know you're an avid biker. Hi, Sarah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, yeah, my name is Dan Castrona. I live in Ward 4 on Tracy Drive. And James, I appreciate the organizing around this. Um, I get around the city on a bike and often with my three-year-old son. Um, yeah, and would love traffic calming on Star Farm Road and also support the um, connecting the bike path and support the North Ave Class 3 Ave project. Um, thanks, Sarah. Great. Thank you, and thank you, James, for that presentation. Appreciate it. Ready? Um, lots of good energy. I uh, want to move on to our last agenda point before um, we adjourn the meeting and say anybody who is energized to join the steering committee and be part of um, setting the agendas for these meetings and hosting the meetings that we have monthly here, uh, we are looking for some folks to join the steering committee. Um, I think we've got two representatives from each ward right now, um, two from seven and two from four. So we've got room for people on uh, both sides of the avenue. Um, we won't be voting tonight, but just kind of wanted to put that out there. Um, I know there's some folks who had reached out to us who are interested, um, and we do plan to have those nominations and vote some new members into the steering committee next month. Um, and our next meeting will be the fourth Wednesday of October, which is the 20 something. <laughs> Third, I think, 23rd, thank you, 23rd of October, fourth Wednesday of the month, um, in this room from six to eight, um, also on Zoom. Thanks to the folks who tuned in online tonight. Um, thanks, Charlie and Hannah. And Charlie wanted to join in with one thing. Okay, I just wanted to see before people left. So I go to all the MP meetings, okay? And when I see the fact that over 60 people came here tonight, that's a really strong pair of MPAs. Okay, so, and then the fact that it was all reorganized since last fall in less than a year, that is a tremendous sign of strength and stability for an MPA. That this way, and here we are at 8 o'clock, and there's still all these people here. Okay, so that is a very strong indication about your MPA. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Wow. Thanks, Charlie. And I also just wanted to thank Hannah for being here, for filling in for Fusca, who has left the CEDO uh, position and holding down our online folks and our stuff over here. All righty. We will see everyone next month. Um, yeah, adjourn. Yay.